Greetings and hello to everyone. This is the Business of Betting Podcast and I'm your host, Jake Williams. Today is episode 29 and we have Dr. William Zemba joining the show. Dr. Zemba earned his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He also taught financial modeling and stochastic optimization at the University of British Columbia from 1968 until 2006. His expertise lie in horse racing, sports betting, finance and investing among other things. We cover a myriad of topics and gain insight from a world leading academic, thinker, investor and author. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. As always, you can find us at businessofbetting.com or at bettingpod on Twitter. Please fire in any questions or feedback and potential guests you would like to hear from. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy my chat with Dr. William Zemba. Today I'm joined by Dr. William Zemba. Dr. Zemba, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Dr. Zemba, you grew up near Saratoga, is that right? Correct, in uh, Berkshire's Adams Mass, which is about uh, an hour and a half drive away in a very nice part of the world, a uh, very calm place, and uh, I've always enjoyed Saratoga. been going there for 50 years. <laughs> so that's horse racing country. That's the heart of it right up there in the Berkshires. What was your involvement in the early years of your life in horse racing? Well, I, we just went to the races. And uh, when I uh, went to uh, British Columbia after I finished PhD in Berkeley, I started working on racing. And the, initially what I did was try to do factor models for probabilities. But then I was visiting uh, in, in uh, Berkeley and David Pyle, finance guy, introduced me to Mark Rubin. Stein of, uh, of uh, portfolio insurance fame, in, in fame, I guess. Uh, and we started working together. And what we did is we started looking at the stock market, the racing market as a stock market, and, and so forth. And that was a key way of doing it. And then later, uh, I connected with Don Hosh, and we worked on it and uh rubenstein stayed for the first paper and we continued it and we did different books etc and basically what we do is we price the bet what's the value it's not how good the horse is it's how good the bet on the horse is uh etc so what you can do is you price the bets and you take the good ones now the question is so that's the first part and in every betting situation you always have two parts. Try to get the estimates of the probabilities or the means or something of that sort. I call it getting the mean right in the stock market as well. And then how do you bet? How much do you bet? And for, for how much do you bet, we tend to like Kelly betting. What Kelly betting is, it's rather aggressive uh, and you – maximize the expected log. Uh, for those who might be interested, uh, Ed Thorpe and I have a, a big handbook on the Kelly Criteria paperback. All my books are on Amazon and World Scientific, and I force the publisher to have them low price by doing paperbacks. Uh, it's a battle with the publishers these days. They want to uh, rip off the authors and, uh, and the readers. But if you have leverage on them and force them to uh, have lower prices, they'll, they'll bend a little bit. So anyway, so anyway, we have that. So that that's I think the definitive book around on how how much to bet, how much to bet, Kelly. It is aggressive, uh, the betting, uh, but there are good investors who, who adhere to this. Uh, Warren Buffett, uh, George Soros. Maynard Keynes, famous Keynes, were all Kelly-type bettors. Kelly-type bettors have the following characteristics. They make a long sequence of bets, 
that are somewhat similar. They have some monthly losses because they're fairly aggressive, but in the long run, they usually end up with the most money in the end. And, and you, you all know that both Soros and uh, and and Buffett uh, have accumulated quite a bit of money. Uh, you know, they're they're both uh, more than twenty or thirty, fifty, hundred billion dollars. Uh, and, and, and so forth. Now, the kind of bets you get, you tend to not diversify that much. Uh, you tend to, to bet on the, on, the, on the best things, on the best things and plunge. So you lose some of them and that goes down. But in the end, you usually go better. So I hear you have an interest in the greatest horses, teams. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you're doing in that area? I'm very interested actually in uh, the greatest in every sport. Uh, baseball, uh, uh, um, Len McLean and I are doing papers on baseball and what we're doing is we're evaluating the greatest hitters of all time. And we have one paper that evaluates, uh, Ted Williams, 1941, uh, Babe Ruth, 1923, which is actually his very best year. What, what's not known by everybody is that Babe Ruth was a fantastic home run hitter, but he was also a fantastic hitter. He only had a batting average lifetime two points below Ted Williams, who's considered the, 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 the greatest natural hitter in baseball history. But then when we evaluate, we also compare him to Barry Bonds. And it turns out Barry Bonds uh, is just as good as, 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 as Williams and, uh, and Ruth. In, in his record as well. Now I know he's tainted by the uh, by the drugs and so forth, but he was he was a fantastic player. And I I have one of my investors is a guy who had 10 20 vision, which means just like Ted Williams, he could see at 20 feet what somebody else could see at 10. Uh, and he told me two stories about. Uh, First of all, about Bonds. Bonds would never swing at pitches that were not in the strike zone. So he was very, very good about that. Uh, and, and with Williams, Williams was so good at doing things, they had an experiment because this, this guy was in the minor leagues uh, and decided not to go into baseball but to go into making money. Uh, which which he's successful at. But anyway, he said that Williams was a bunch of players. They put a glove way out in the outfield, and Williams says, I'll swing five times and I'll hit that glove. To be that accurate that he could uh, place it exactly there. And uh, and the fourth hit, uh, he hit it. It was incredible. So, you know, these, these guys were, were, were phenomenally great. So it's very interesting to study the, the greats of these these sports. Uh, Gretzky in in hockey was a four standard deviation person. Uh, there are no baseball four standard deviations except for Babe Ruth. In uh, by me, four standard deviations means four standard deviations better than the average player. Now Gretzky was four four better than than the than the, the average players. Uh, Williams and Ty Cobb and all these other great hitters are three. But, uh, but uh, Ruth is a four when it comes to hitting home runs. I mean, he would hit 55 home runs and the next person would hit 18. So it was, it was a incredible uh, difference how much so better. So was that peak of his powers or throughout his whole career? No, th throughout. And in fact, he was a good pitcher as well before he switched. <laughs> With the, with the Red Sox, uh, I grew up in Massachusetts. I was a Red Sox fan. Uh, at the moment, I kind of a, I'm a kind of a joint Yankees Red Sox fan. I mean, the games I like to watch the most are Yankees against Red Sox, uh, and and they seem to alternate being good. Once in a while, the Red Sox are good, and then they're no good anymore. And then two years later, they're good again, etc. And the Yankees. Uh, have been good lately they're not so good but uh you know they had a, a big run this year they had um you know their power hitter their their right fielder 
who hit a lot of home runs, and uh, so he created a lot of a lot of interest as, as well. So, so it, it's quite interesting there. So, in any of that, we have the greats in in, in everything in uh, you know in tennis and in in the stock market and uh, so forth. And I, I try myself in my own trading to uh, try to be a great. I worked a lot with Thorpe, and I understand how he did it. He, he was very, very good uh, in his era, and he he was quite a while, a while ago, though. Uh, he he finished in uh, 68 to 88, so it's it's like 30 years ago. Uh, he had a good advantage that there was high T bills, which we do not have now. Uh, 8% in, the, in that era. At the moment, the T-bills are giving you basically zero. Uh, so you have to earn all the money. But he, and he did very well. He, he did extremely so what well. So about, what about Bill Benta? You spent some time working with him, I believe. How was that experience? Well, uh, Benta, uh, I helped him in the early days with uh, stuff as did Hosh. He put uh, a paper in our book, uh, Hosh, Low and Zimba. And... Uh, that helped the book become more of a cult item, which it still is. Uh, and uh, he was a very successful guy. Uh, I My main contact with him is uh, I'm an uh, expert witness in a court case that's been going on the last five years of one of his employees who spun off and hired somebody to make models, and the person basically stole the models. So, uh, so I'm I'm involved with that. Uh, Benter is very successful. He had good ideas. It took him a couple of years to get it together, though. Uh, in, in the early stages, it's not easy to get these teams to go to go. Uh, there's quite a bit of issues there, and he discovered a few things in the theory. Uh, I like to think that if somebody wants to learn the theory of of horse racing for for betting. I have the Hoshlow and Zimba book, uh, which was 94 revision 2008. Don't buy the 94 book because it's very expensive, but the 2008 book from World Scientific is cheap. I wanted to ask about... Yes, uh, sir. You wrote in the efficiencies of racetrack betting markets about exploiting the paramutual and the tote inefficiencies. Do you think as long as there are totes and paramutual pools that there will be inefficiencies? I think so because it's the behavior of the people. Uh, people ha have certain ways that they they, they bet on things, and um, that's sort of the key. And that's what I use in the in the stock market, and we still have it in racing as, as well. Uh, in in terms of different different things, racing is more complicated now because, first of all. There are more of these professional teams. Uh, there's one team that has 300 people working. Uh, and when I spoke with them uh, about eight, eight or ten years ago, they had 80 people working. And they were betting $1.2 billion per year, making 15%, $180 million. Uh, and now they're expanding. So there's teams this big. Uh, much bigger than what Venter was doing. Ready for a different way of thinking? Unlike other operators, Betfair wants you to win. On the Betfair Hub, you'll unlock market-leading insights, strategies, models, and more. Master the game within the game on the Betfair Hub. Gamble responsibly. We've seen Winks and Black Caviar in Australia, obviously American Pharaoh, Arrogate more well, recently. There's been a few in the recent times. Yeah, we'll see... Black Caviar won all her races. Now, I have studied the following, and I'm very interested in, in undefeated horses. In fact, I, I, can I tell you one thing? I think we might breed to one horse that's undefeated. He had one race and, and, and won. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to do it. With a 114 buyer. But seriously, what I, what I try to do in my calculation is – the horse has to have 10 races at the top competition and then be undefeated since 1900. 
Now, if you do that, you have colon 1907 in the U.S. and personal ends in 1988, and that is it. In Europe, you have four of them. There's Niarco, uh, and Niarco was very interesting because every single ARC winner of the pre to ARC was either by one of his sons or one of his grandsons for 25 years, every single one. So that was, that was he was undefeated. Tessio horse, Tessio's the trainer. And then Tessio's greatest horse uh, actually was running after Tessio died. He died in 1954, and, and uh, his greatest horse was running in 55 and 56, won the arc. And then he had one other undefeated horse. And then the other undefeated horse in Europe is Frankel, who some actually consider greater than, than anybody in history as, as well. So, so anyway, what's interesting is one trainer had many of them. Now, when you go to Australia, the only one I've been able to find actually is Black Caviar. There's another filly who won the Melbourne Cup three times, but she had losses. She had losses. But she had, yes, yes. A f- a fantastic record, but not, not undefeated. But I haven't found any other uh, uh, Australian horses yet. But there, there, there could be. I, I don't know. There's lots of horses that have sort of undefeated who were in minor racetracks or had seven races or five races or nine. But when you, when you go to ten, the, you just get very, very few. Uh, as well. Tassio's greatest horse uh, was called Darpino, in his opinion, was, was um, the, he had six races, he won them all, uh, but so forth. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting how, how you do it uh, in terms of them. Uh, one of the greatest sires of all time, Danzig, who was at Claiborne Farms, had three races, won them all, had an injury, and then became a fantastic sire, one of the greatest sires in history. Uh, and uh, the the one that that um, had one race and, and, and I guess got injured, but he ran a one fourteen buyer in his one race. Uh, I think it's, it's called McLean's uh, something, uh, and. Uh, you know, it's interesting. So, so, so when you were in, I guess you're in Australia, you're probably talking to someone or Jelko himself by the sounds of the money you were mentioning, or maybe David Walsh in Tasmania. What did you observe from speaking to some of those people in those large syndicates? And no, I, I, did, I did meet them, and they're connected to hedge fund people that I know as well. See, the hedge fund people and the top racing people are all kind of connected monies from one go to the other back and forth as well they're very very successful uh they're 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 they're, they're very successful uh and they, they are the they are the big team uh and uh they're they're basically everywhere and, and they're very successful uh they've taken ideas from some from me and and don hosh and our books uh and from other people and they've made it work just like Benter did so you have to give them credit uh, so, you know, they, they did, uh, you know, a, you know, a good job in, in terms of, of that. So how, how possible or easy or ideal is it to take knowledge from investing in the stock market and even academic research and apply it to horse racing or sports betting and I guess cross well, different markets? Well, I, I, I think there are different things. First of all, in NFL, which I'm doing a, a book on NFL now which is strategies, misconceptions, uh, and, and also actual betting that I do. I, what I like to do is I like to do the betting to learn and then write about it, whether I win or lose. Okay. So, so I try to do that. Uh, so, so in there, mean reversion is super important. Mean reversion, what you do is you try to create Risk arbitrage. Arbitrage is you bet on A, 
at a certain price. You bet on B, the opponent, at a certain price in such a way that no matter who wins, you're ahead. Okay, so that's arbitrage. Now, we find arbitrages because there could be prices in different places. You know, so on one exchange or this thing. Now, risk arbitrage is you try to create an arbitrage, but it may not exist. So a typical example is, uh, suppose you're a New England Patriot fan, which I am. <laughs> okay, they, they tend to be starting slow, often behind, but then towards the end of the game, they start charging, and they're tough. They're really tough. So, so what you can do is make a bet on New England, who will usually be the favorite. They're usually the favorite. And then try to get, let them get a, a, a head. And if they get ahead, the odds on the other horse be, are good, and then you lock up a risk arbitrage. So you can't lose. Some of the games are really memorable because you have lead changes. Uh, there was a playoff game between San Francisco and New Orleans uh, in 2012 where there were four lead changes the last three minutes. And the prices were just everywhere on the board. Uh, so that was a great example. You see the numbers. You want more control. On the Betfair Exchange, you can back, lay, trade, and set your own odds. So join the world's largest peer-to-peer -peer betting platform. Get into the game within the game at betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. If you go back to the Super Bowl last year, New England uh, was behind by 25 points. Now, normally, if a team is behind by 7 or 14 points, with mean reversion, they can catch up. But it's very rare that if they're behind by three, three scores, three scores, which would be 17 or, or to 21, it's, it's very hard to, to catch up because you'll catch up most of the way, but then the other team will get something, et cetera. But what New England did, which was remarkable, is they came back from 25 points behind and, and actually won the game. And, and I was watching the odds during the, the game. I had a bet on them to start with, and, and I did write it up. It's written up in Wilmot Magazine. Uh, the the story on this and uh, it's in it's in this new book too uh, and anyway the the odds got longer and longer it's 15 to 1 20 to 1 it was 30 to 1 when they were 25 points behind but I didn't take any of it because I figured nah it's not going to make it but they did make it etc so that so that's there now in terms of the stock market I always maintain that I learned an awful lot about trading uh, S&P futures from the biases in the wind market in, in horse racing. So that's what I'll always argue, favorite long shot bias and stuff, et cetera. So that seems to be that. There's more to it, of course. You have to watch your hedging and your position sizes and, and so forth. But I did learn an awful lot from... How do you think about you know, money management and Kelly, I guess, in the sports betting context? Are you thinking no. half Kelly or a quarter Kelly even in those no. circumstances? No, no. There, there it's used a lot because the people... First of all, the people who do sports betting are more serious and more knowledgeable than the, than the average person doing the stock market. Uh, there's no question about that because they're, they're average fans, uh, et cetera. So they would know more technical things and more advanced things and more risk control. And many of the greatest hedge fund traders in the stock market came from backgrounds of uh, gambling. Thorpe came from blackjack. Benter came from blackjack. Bill Gross uh uh, came from blackjack. Uh, many, many people like that. I guess I'm one of the ones who came from horse racing. 
uh, but many have come from, from blackjack. It teaches people how to uh, think about risk and, 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 and stuff like that uh, as well. And sports betting is, is important. And, and uh, in terms of, of fractional Kelly, it, it depends. In, in, the, in, the, in the book, Great Investment Ideas, we have simulations of, of one quarter Kelly, half Kelly, et cetera, in terms of different uh, situations. So you have to sort of balance your risk profile uh, and, your, and your situation to decide what's, what's actually the best. Very often, uh, teams are doing some kind of fractional Kelly, uh, but it, it's going to vary a lot depending on the actual situation and uh, your risk tolerance and how much money you have and so forth. A lot of people ask about overbetting, and they know it's a bad thing, and they'll say that I'll, you know, I'll calculate my edge and I'll go through my Kelly betting system, whatever that might be, fractional or other otherwise. Yeah. How do you sort of advise people or speak to people about overbetting and, and some of the things you can be doing to prevent it? Overbetting. When you're doing sports betting, you're doing calculations, so you can probably not overbet. You'll you'll actually do it right. Where you get trouble overbetting is in the stock market with options. Uh, when the when the prices move, uh, the delta of your position changes dramatically uh, and you can easily get from under under evaluation to over over betting uh, and then get into trouble the worst days in my opinion are you go into a, a day net long the market rallies and halfway through the through the day you're net short because of the models, the market's gone up so much, and and you wind up losing on the day. Right. So that's 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 the worst day. Now now, what I think you're mostly uh, talking about here is what can happen if if there's a big fall, uh, and you, you so forth. So the usual case for uh, overbetting, that's where you get into trouble when when. Uh, you have a position, and all of a sudden, the the market level changes or the VIX changes, and and all of a sudden you you were safe and then you're not safe anymore. So, but uh, I'm a stochastic programming type, and so we believe that uh, that's the proper way to do calculations. So Alpha Z advises. I had a quick look into that and some of the. Annual returns by year, you had a bad year, and that was, or the, sorry, the worst year was 13%, and the best year at the moment, 109%. The, thir- the first year was actually half a year. <laughs> okay, okay. So that's why it was so low in, in relative terms to some of these other ridiculously high numbers. But Well, it- actually, I don't think I take that much risk. What I try to do is what I find is important is to pay attention to plan for what's going to happen and then react fast as things move. You, you got to really be able to make split decisions in five seconds of, of what to do. You got to watch the thing. And when it moves a certain way, you have to say, I'm going to do it. And you have to be able to have the guts not to sell at the bottom. Most people are, the market falls 10 points. Oh, no, you got to go out, get get out. You're going to be over margin. You're going to be over margin, you know, and then so forth. This year is especially good at, it bounces down and then it comes back and it comes back, et cetera. And it's a bit different during the night than in the day, uh, so forth. So you got to have patience. You got to be willing to be behind for a few days and then assume that you'll f- figure it out and gain in the end uh, as well. But most people, I think, don't quite have the guts to try to do it. And the other thing is it's really good to study the, study the books and understand uh, you know, how things work. Uh, so you, you learn a lot on, on this, okay? 
So I, I think I read in Ed Thorpe's book, The Man for All Markets, that he suggests, everyone asks him all the time, what should an everyday investor do? And he says that, you know, factoring all the information, you may be better off just putting your money in an index uh, with low fees, hopefully, and, and leaving it yeah. there. What yeah. is your thoughts on that type of approach? Yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with that, and that's perfectly good. It does quite well. Index funds will beat three quarters of all investors with less cost. However, there's there's a there's one particular index fund that's that's easy to do. That's Warren Buffett. Now Warren Buffett is essentially an index fund, and he has returns at about double the S and P. So I would say, well, fine, I have a whole bunch of Warren Buffett too, because uh, he he seems to be doing okay, and Warren Buffett is very good in the downturn, and he's always making deals that are very advantageous. He's very, very smart. Uh, he's got all sorts of super good things going. Uh, and, and he's got a lot of different things. He's kind of diversified, so so forth. But no, it's certainly, certainly that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the other thing is it's very important to have your monies in lots of places, not just one place because it could... Uh, you, you could have people pinching the money or, or, or trouble in one place. So it's very good to diversify. Uh, but n no, it's perfectly, uh, per perfectly good sense. But I would add Buffett to that, you know, as well. So I want to ask one more question and, and I guess you probably get asked all the time, but for people or, prof you know, recreational or professionals looking to get into horse racing, looking to get into sports betting, what are some of the most important sort of pillars that they need to be thinking about if they want to survive long term and be as successful as someone like you over decades rather than just, you know, a, a small sample size of one or two seasons? Start doing it with small amounts of money. Get your feet wet. Do actual betting with small amounts where you don't lose much and, and learn the things that work for you and the things that don't work for you. You know, and read the literature. I mean, like I, what I tell people if they want to follow a little bit what I do, I've got about eight eight of these books. Uh, uh, for example, turn of the year effect. I played twenty years in a row, writing papers about it, giving talks about it, and I won every single year except this past. Uh, 2016 failed and it failed because there was a rate increase by uh, Yellen which did not matter but what mattered was the fear of many more rate increases and it scared the hell out of people so that the the effect did not work but basically I was able to write four times papers telling them exactly the formulas I do, put it exactly in my books like like I have the book called Calendar Anomalies. It had, tells, uh, you know, exactly uh, edges for different things, etc. Most people are just not going to do this stuff or take the time to do it. But it, but it's there if you want to do it, so and so, and so forth. So I have a bunch of books. They're all on World Scientific mostly. Uh, and... Uh, you know, you, you read the books, get some ideas, bet small amounts of money, small amounts, uh, lose a little. That's your tuition. Instead of paying to go to Harvard, you, you pay a little tuition by, by betting and try to stay even. And um, you'll, you'll probably do, do fine. Then you learn, et cetera. You get, you, the only way you learn is by doing it with real money. You cannot just sit in the university and and and, and pontificate like ninety percent of the professors who who don't trade money. So this is I could have done this. I could have done this. Bullshit. If you do it, you have to do it with real money, so forth. In fact, I just wanted to mention the website. There's a lot of good information. It's WilliamTZemba.com. That's correct. Yes. Perfect. Now that's great. I really really appreciate your time, and uh, I look forward to meeting Chris? one day. Jake, this has been great. It's been fun. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and please support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Gamble responsibly.